Welcome everyone to today's Westpac National Press Club Address uh, on a fairly interesting day in Canberra. I'm Tony Melville, Treasurer of the National Press Club. In 10 years' time, we may be uh, celebrating the crisis that started today, but for today, we're looking at a crisis from 10 years ago. In 2008, US banking giant the Lehman Brothers uh, filed for bankruptcy, sending shockwaves across the global financial markets. With $639 billion in assets and $619 billion in debt, Lehman's bankruptcy filing was the largest in history and is widely seen as the beginning of the global financial crisis. On this eve of the 10-year anniversary of the GFC, we have a panel discussion on the lessons of the GFC and what needs to change if we are to create an Australian economy that has truly learnt the lessons of the past. This is a particularly important discussion and it is held in the shadow of the Banking Royal Commission. Our guests today are former Treasurer Wayne Swan, editor of The Guardian Australia, Lenore Taylor, and visiting fellow at the Lowy Institute, John Edwards. They'll be discussing how appropriate was Australia's response and can it happen again? So first up is Lenore Taylor. Lenore is a much awarded journalist. She was, uh, is uh, the editor of The Guardian Australia and has been since 2016. Before that, Lenore was senior political writer in, here in Canberra for both the Canberra Times and the Sydney Morning Herald. Her first book, Shitstorm, with David Uren, was published in 2010 and told the inside story of the government's attempts to, compact, to combat the global financial crisis. Please welcome Lenore Taylor. So, uh, thank you very much, Tony, um, and it's an honour to be talking today uh, after the award of the Wallace Brown Award. I was uh, one of the many journalists who benefited from his wise counsel and advice, although he never did quite convert me to black velvets. That was his favourite drink and I didn't like them. Um, so, a, a lot of the memories, I think, have faded since the global financial crisis and those events of 2008 and 2009. Uh, for example, people now look a bit askance when uh, I tell them the title of the book that I co-authored uh, back then. My dear late mum had all manner of difficulty at the Bowls Club telling the other old ladies that I'd authored a book and then not ever mentioning the title. But at least that back then when people heard the title, they remembered that it was something that the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd had used to describe what his government faced. In fact, Kevin Rudd launched Shitstorm on June 21st, 2010. Wayne was there and a lot of our press gallery colleagues came too. I think that may have had more to do with the convulsions going on in the Labor Party at the time than their complete fascination with what we'd written because just three days after that, Kevin Rudd lost the Prime Ministership. Malcolm Turnbull was the leader of the Liberal Party during most of the events we described, but he'd already been dispatched the previous year by Tony Abbott. By the, so by the time the book came out, he was already no longer leader. So in some ways, rereading this book ahead of today's events took me back to events that seem like a long time ago, but in other ways, it feels like nothing much has changed. Um, I've not been as deeply involved in post-GFC economics as Wayne and John, so I really just want to make four observations today uh, that came to me looking back at that time and the research that we did for the book. The first one is that people seem to have very selective memories. Um, some people, particularly in the coalition, like to play down the idea or even sort of pretend like there was no global financial crisis in order to make the point that, you know, Labor's not to be trusted with the economy. Um, Treasurer Scott Morrison gave a speech to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry late last year where he warned that Labor couldn't be trusted with the economy because the Rudd government had turned a $20 billion surplus into a $27 billion deficit in just one year without any mention of why that spending might have occurred. So it seemed worth remembering via uh, what we wrote in the book exactly the positions that the coalition took in opposition in response to Labor's stimulus packages. They did, um, as we know, immediately support the first $10.4 billion stimulus. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull told us that decision was motivated partly by the spirit of the times. He said, we thought we should cut the government some slack. They were making decisions in a tough environment. Secondly, the bulk of the money was going to pensioners, who we had been arguing should get a lift in their pensions. So given all of those things taken together, we decided not to oppose it. When the government proposed its second $42 billion package, there was some in between, but the second major package, in February 2009, the coalition did oppose it. 
But Malcolm Turnbull argued that it should have been smaller, that maybe 15 or $20 billion would have been more appropriate, and that it should have comprised in part but not in whole a bringing forward of already um, mooted tax cuts. He also conceded in an interview with us for the book that the decision to oppose the second stimulus was based on the calculation that it was going to pass the Senate anyway with the support of the Greens, and that if it hadn't passed, then the coalition would have had to negotiate. So the argument between the major parties then was not about whether to spend, but rather about how much to spend and what proportion of the response should be tax cuts as opposed to spending programs. For the record, in our book, we concluded that with the benefit of hindsight, the government may well have been able to spend a bit less and still avoid recession because the economy did bounce back faster than anticipated, which meant that some of that second stimulus package was rolling out when arguably it was no longer needed. They're both taking notes right now. I expect Wayne will disagree with me on that point. And in any event, I think it's important to say, to, you know, to remember that he and the other people in that gang of four that were making the crucial decisions didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They had to make the decisions in real time and in response to um, events that were unfolding in unpredictable and pretty cataclysmic ways. So I think, you know, on this first point, the coalition can certainly emphasise that other things Australia had going for it as the crisis hit in comparison to other OECD economies. They had a budget surplus to deploy, room for the central bank to reduce interest rates. But the record shows that the coalition's response at the time, if they'd been in a position to do what they were advocating at the time, would almost certainly also have turned a surplus into a deficit quite quickly. Um, the second observation was that the bureaucracy back then had very clear advice to give. In the course of our research, my co-author, David Uren, discovered that when the government began asking the Treasury for advice about economic stimulus, the department was able to dust off an analysis that it had done after Paul Keating's 1992 One Nation st statement, which had been the previous time that a government had, had to spend to get life back into the economy. That um, analysis had been done in secret in 2004 for obvious reasons. The Treasury didn't think it was a terrific idea to trumpet the fact that it was doing contingency planning for a possible future recession. And it had deliberately conducted that planning exercise when the economy was strong so that it could have ready advice and understandings to give to a government when and if a future crisis hit. Um, it concluded that cash handouts had worked well that big infrastructure spending was problematic because it often took too long to roll out. And that meant that when 2008 and 2009 happened, the Treasury had advice ready. And the government, the government accepted the advice. Uh, they were also looking for double dividends. So in addition to sort of straight cash injections, projects that could get employment going across the country, create jobs. And that's where the home insulation project and education infrastructure projects came from, although there were well-documented problems in, in the practice of rolling them out. What's not clear to me right now is whether Treasury has done another analysis like that in the past 10 years. Um, there might be someone in the room who can enlighten me, but it's not even entirely clear to me whether Treasury still holds the view that fiscal stimulus is the right way to go in principle. We know that the former Treasury Secretary John Fraser republished um, academic Tony Macon's long-standing critical analysis of uh, the Rudd government's response, but we also know that the head of the Prime Minister's department had previously criticised that same paper or that same analysis. So even before we get up to the differing circumstances now, it's not really clear to me what advice a government now would get from the bureaucracy should it again face such a crisis. And I'm, I find that kind of concerning because let's face it, when these things hit, there isn't a lot of time to sit around arguing and figuring it out. So I hope for our sakes there was another secret planning meeting sometime in the last 10 years and they have got it all ready to go. Um, the third thing that came back with sort of some clarity rereading our book was how, how relatively powerless we were as a nation state once that sort of global financial contagion took hold in the financial system. It didn't really matter that our own financial institutions didn't really have toxic assets on their balance sheets. If they had dealings with other banks that did, then we had a problem. It was, it was a viral situation. It kind of swept over incremental national policy making. Um, and so afterwards, there was a lot of consideration, as you would expect, by bankers and regulators around the world about what could be done to prevent this happening again. So um, 
to my mind, that means that we should be quite alert to the ongoing efforts in the US now to undo some of the regulatory changes that happened post-GFC. GFC. So the recent winding back of the coverage of the Dodd-Frank Act or the plans to and, and push to wind back the Volcker Rule, the rule that prevented the banks from making financial bets for their own benefit rather than the benefit of their customers. Um, I think it's in our interest to pay very, very close attention to those things given the experience of what happened 10 years ago. And my fourth and final observation is that pol policymakers back then didn't know the half of it. They were intent and very, um, and very attuned to stopping the social and human dislocation of a recession. The dramatic increase in unemployment was really at the forefront of their minds. Um, I remember Wayne talking about it at the time, about workers in their midlife who, if they were retrenched as a result of a recession, would never get a job again. But I don't think anyone then could have really foreseen the political dislocation of the past 10 years. I mean, politics often polarises after big financial crises, but I think this time the slow pace of recovery around the world from the GFC exacerbated that, and the fact that it happened right at the point of the huge digital disruption exacerbated it again, and the fact that it happened right when the media is in crisis, is in sort of existential crisis, exacerbated it again, and made the political ramifications bigger than I think anyone really anticipated. Um, Australia's been shielded a little bit from that uh, by having compulsory voting, by having a relatively stronger social safety net, but not entirely. We know that wages have stagnated, that income inequality has certainly not improved, that wealth inequality is on the rise. So we're not as far down that path of disillusionment with major party politics, but we're certainly headed in the same direction and Lord knows they seem to be doing their very best to accelerate that process at the moment. That's a subject for another whole speech, but I think it underlines the need to retain and think about the right lessons from 10 years ago and to remember the important things. Kevin Rudd used that term shitstorm in a TV interview to describe the scare campaign that he knew was coming over the debt and the government borrowing he was about to undertake. But it's turned out that the, whole, the shitstorm was a whole lot bigger than he could possibly have foreseen and much longer lasting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is the Treasurer at the time of the GFC and former Deputy Prime Minister and member for Lily Wayne Swan. Wayne was named World's Top Finance Minister of 2011 by Euromoney magazine for his role in guiding Australia through the GFC without going into, rece into recession. Please welcome Wayne Swan. Well, uh, thanks very much. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, it's hard to imagine just how uncertain it was. I mean, we were looking at a situation of either going into recession or going into deep deficit. And we knew that we were staring down the possibility of a Great Depression Mark II. And I'd grown up uh, with a Depression generation. I mean, my father's family had been scarred by events uh, in the Depression. Uh, and I was acutely aware of what the Great Depression had done and its impact on politics and society and the policy challenges that it posed for my predecessors. So Kevin Rudd and I took our responsibilities uh, very seriously in this environment. And as it turned out, we were one of only two advanced economies to avoid recession. It was our timely deployment of monetary and fiscal policy that got us through the GFC. Elsewhere in the world, it's known as the Great Recession. Here, it's known as the GFC. So we came through by choice, not by chance. We avoided recession, the policy worked, and I think as a consequence, Australia has now enjoyed 27 years of continuous growth, as you can see in the graph. So why is all this uh, relevant now? Well, it is the 10-year anniversary, but I think as Lenore has uh, referred to, there are still political outcomes from that period which are bouncing around economics uh, and politics. So I say the past is not dead, it's not even past. And the GFC is certainly one of those cases because what obsesses and frightens all of us today is political volatility of a type the Western world hasn't experienced since the 1930s. There's a ring of fire of nativist extremist political forces ascendant 
across the world and thriving in societies very similar to our own, the United Kingdom and the United States. The fact that these forces exist in Australia should concern us all, but the fact that they are tiny fringe movements mean, means that we have got something right. Now, in the middle of the GFC, we spoke of global economic volatility not seen for 80 years. Today, we speak of political volatility not seen for 80 years. And there is a connection. Big economic shocks have big political consequences. 1929 was followed by 1939. So if we fail to take the right lessons from the Great Recession and our response to it, we will expose ourselves to the full force of the next economic crisis. So we might not be talking about a global economic crisis today, but in my view, we are living in the consequences of the last one. And there are two areas here I want to focus on briefly. The first is on ideas and the practice of economics itself. And the second is on what, uh, what made Australia different and what must we learn from this experience. Now, firstly and quickly on ideas. And I want to start with an admission. I've said a few times since the crisis that everyone active in economic policy making today needs to be asked this very simple question. Which of your settled opinions about how economies operate changed as a result of the GFC? And if the answer is none, you're either a genius or a charlatan. That's the truth of it. As we know, there are a precious few geniuses who can claim to have seen that crisis coming. For me, my approach to economics has changed. Whereas previously I regarded tackling inequality primarily as social policy, it is great social policy, but social policy first and foremost. I now regard it as absolutely central to good economic policy, tackling inequality. And I believe that viewing economics through the frame of inequality will give Australia a better economic result in the long run. The GFC taught us rising inequality isn't just an important moral challenge something we tackle with the proceeds of growth once we can afford it and trade off for further economic growth later on. It is an economic challenge that determines how prosperous and stable our economy can be, and therefore it is of fundamental and central importance to the health of any democracy. And a decade after the GFC, we can see clearly that rising inequality globally isn't just making societies less fair. It's making economies less prosperous, less stable, more fragile and more crisis prone. And it's having a similar effect on our politics. So the GFC hasn't just changed my opinion. Fortunately, in the 10 years since the crisis, the IMF, the OECD and other previous bastions of neoliberalism have executed nearly 180 degree turns in their policy prescriptions, from fiscal austerity to more active fiscal policy. Now to our second question. What made Australia different and what can we learn from that? Now, I could go into the history of it, but there's a very, very good book by a former treasurer somewhere in all those good bookstores, which I recommend you have a look at. But secondly, the proof of our policy's success is in the industry devoted to attacking those policies. And that industry is still going strong after 10 years, and Lenore alluded uh, to the actions of the previous Treasury Secretary in commissioning work specifically to attack Treasury work on the crisis. Any day of the week of the last decade, you can open a copy of The Australian on the Financial Review and you'll read a denunciation of active fiscal policy or indeed any other crisis response other than surrendering to the cleansing fire of a recession. Hence, despite Australia's success relative to our peers, there's been a determined and publicly funded campaign to discredit the stimulus. They say it's unnecessary because of China, it was too big, or it had too little public support. And I want to make three brief points about that. Firstly, the miners were actually retrenching workers during the economic crisis at its height. Secondly, the ongoing pipeline of public investment from 2009 to 2011 supported our continuing growth as the world was shook by, by a whole series of events uh, right across uh, Europe uh, and the developed world through 2010 and 2011. And then thirdly, the Australian people were unmoved by the deniers. A majority of Australians, a remarkable 62%, agree that the GFC would have sent the country into recession if Labor hadn't provided the large fiscal stimulus we did. 
only 22% disagree. Now, you wouldn't get that impression if you were looking at much of the public analysis of what actually occurred during that time. So let me close uh, with, with these thoughts. What we avoided here was the capital and skills destruction that has been crucial to locking in the high levels of growth in Australia that we have achieved since, this, uh, since the global financial crisis. And what it has meant is that unemployment in Australia has been consistently lower and deficit and debt has been consistently lower than it would have been if we hadn't taken the actions that we did. By contrast, in the United States, in Great Britain, the early withdrawal of stimulus and the inadequacy of the stimulus in the United States, States condemned these countries to a slower recovery and to higher levels of capital and skills destruction. So for me, the key lesson uh, from these comparisons is that the avoidance of deep recessions improves outcomes in the labour market over an extended period of time. So for fiscal policy, the GFC in its aftermath points to, need, to the need for governments to be much more active in using tax and expenditure measures as structural instruments to improve medium to long-term growth. And also, just as important are so-called pre-distributional concerns, such as market regulation, very important in finance, but also measures that support a strong voice for labour in the form of a higher minimum wage and an explicit set of minimum conditions. Now, the problem is I today doubt the capacity or ability of global institutions to respond as they did at the height of the GFC in 2007 and 2008. And that is a very big red flag uh, for not only for the global economy, but for political stability. I also have grave concerns about Australia's capacity to respond to the next crisis. They're partly economic, but they are largely political. While, while I believe that Australia could combat, could combat the next crisis, whether we would combat it would depend on which party was in government and what lessons they had chosen to learn from 2008-2009. In 2008, Labor was facing the choice between a recession and deficit. I fear then, as I fear now, that facing the same choice, the Coalition would give us both. And that, in a nutshell, comes neatly back to answer the question we faced at the start of my remarks. That's why the events of 10 years ago matter crucially for our national prospects today, and they will for many years to come. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Wayne. Our next speaker is John Edwards. John was Principal Economic Advisor to Treasurer and then Prime Minister Paul Keating and later Chief Economist for Australia and New Zealand for HSBC. He served on the board of the Reserve Bank. He is the author of several books, including Keating, The Inside Story and Curtin's Gift. He's a visiting fellow at the Lowy Institute and adjunct professor with the John Curtin Institute of Public Policy at Curtin University. Please welcome John Edwards. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Well, let me just uh, directly address this issue of um, whether the uh, degree of stimulus in 2008-2009 was warranted. Uh, this, uh, uh, to address the argument that's been posed by Tony Macon uh, and uh, published by Treasury. Well, what are the, were the circumstances? The key year was 2009. That was where the uh, impact of the collapse of Lehman um, and the freezing of the financial system at the, in the third quarter, fourth quarter of uh, 2008 became most apparent. Uh, in 2009, US uh, GDP contracted by uh, nearly 3%. Uh, UK contracted by over 4%. Germany contracted by nearly 6%. Huge downturns. Uh, over that year, the Australian economy expanded by 1.74%. Big contrast. Big contrast. And one of the big contrasts was fiscal policy. But it wasn't the only um, instrument we were using. It was also the case that the RBA, um, uh, from August of 2008 began to cut the cash rate uh, from 7.25% to 3% uh, by July of 2009. 
and partly as a consequence, we had a much lower Australian dollar. It fell uh, from 96 cents uh, before the crisis to 64 cents by the beginning of 2009. So those, those um, influences were important. But I'm, I'm inclined to think the big influence, uh, and the reason we stood out uh, compared to other countries, was the swiftness of the fiscal response. That is, in 2007, 2008, we can look back and we see we had a surplus uh, in the uh, federal government budget of 1.7% of GDP, and the following year we had a deficit of 2.1% of GDP, a turn of 3.8% of GDP. That's a pretty good measure of the uh, size of the stimulus. Just around 4% of GDP fiscally delivered, uh, and 2% the following year uh, before fiscal policy started to become contractionary, as it should have. So all up, two big hits um, that uh, contributed substantially to the fact that we got by. Now, it's very hard to identify causes and consequences, but we can say this. We can say that of that uh, growth we achieved in 2009 when uh, comparable economies were contracting, of that growth, None came from mining investment. Mining investment was down. None came from dwelling construction or non-dwelling construction, which were down. Um, none came from business investment, which was down. I'll come to that in a moment. The big contributions of that 1.74%, the big contributions were 1.3 percentage points from uh, household consumption, which was a major focus of the fiscal stimulus. 1.1 percentage points came from um, public uh, investment, another objective of the fiscal stimulus, and 1.2 percent, uh, 1.2 percentage points came from exports, and uh, and uh, China had a lot to do with that. So it's certainly China, certainly it's certainly the case that China was helpful, and exports were helpful, and they had nothing to do with the federal government. But if it was exports alone we would still have been in recession of about 0.7 if we hadn't had that big hit on consumption and on public fixed investment. Well, that doesn't really prove the case, but I think it's really indicative. Um, the Reserve Bank of Australia recently went to a bit more trouble um, to econometrically investigate the impact of the temporary tax break for investment introduced uh, as part of the stimulus response. This was only published in June of 2018, a really good research paper by David Rogers and Jonathan Hamber. And what they found was the tax break had a strong effect on business level investment and uh, that the tax break was important on a macroeconomic level and that um, GDP growth would have been lower without that um, uh, temporary tax break for uh, equipment investment. So, well, to my mind, uh, it's difficult to prove anything in economics, but to my mind, the, the, there's a very strong suggestion there that that fiscal response worked and was appropriate. And I would, uh, to take up the point Lenore made earlier, uh, you can't anyway make policy decisions in hindsight that, uh, so far as I'm concerned, even uh, had the stimulus been too much, and I don't think that's the case, but, but um, opinions differ, even if it had been, it would nonetheless have been appropriate to make that decision in the light of the circumstances that, uh, in the light of the knowledge you had. Um, well, let me just uh, refer to a couple of other issues in respect of, um, in respect of what's happened since. Um, uh, and they've been vastly more important on the rest of the world than us. Um, the US had a downturn, in, uh, uh, downturn from which um, it has now recovered. The US is doing well. Uh, per capita incomes are increasing. Unemployment is at a new low. Growth is okay. Uh, 
and uh, as a matter of fact, seems to be strengthening. Investments picked up. US is US is not not in bad shape at all. However, it will never it will never recover the loss it made uh, in per capita income uh, between uh, 2009 and about uh, 2017. It won't get it back because growth is not fast enough to recover it. It's also the case that in the US, uh, debt to GDP, federal government debt to GDP is uh, more than doubled to now over 100% and it's going to keep going up under this uh, Trump administration. And that does limit the responses it can make to a subsequent crisis. We've, uh, Wayne touched on the um, extraordinary changes to um, economic practice that have occurred as a result of the crisis, and they are truly astonishing. That is, um, uh, the Fed now holds, the US Federal Reserve now holds about a quarter of, um, of US government debt. That um, a practice which before was uh, not inconceivable, but, but very much frowned upon, that is, a central bank buying government debt, as a matter of course, and as a policy instrument, and continuously, and in a big way, was uh, adopted by the Fed in a huge way and then adopted by the European Central Bank in a huge way and by the Bank of Japan in a huge way. And only now, in the case of the Fed, are they starting to run it down. And the process of running it down is one that we'll need to watch for years. I think as a result of the GFC, the European Union and the Euro were put to um, an existential uh, test, a test of whether they would survive, um, whether the common currency would survive and that the euro would survive as an institution. And in 2011, 2012, into 2013, people, were, a lot of people were saying they wouldn't, they have. They've survived uh, and I think um, become a lot stronger as a result of that test. That's been an important outcome of the GFC. It's also the case that in 2013, as a result of the GFC, it would have happened anyway, but in 2013, um, the purchasing power parity adjusted sizes of the US and China economies crossed over. In 2013, in this IMF measure of economic size, China became bigger than the US. And that's because um, post-GFC China uh, ramped up, it was growing at 10% and the US was still contracting. And that's had a huge impact which is now becoming more and more evident. So our world has um, changed considerably as a result of the GFC, changed uh, somewhat here but vastly more elsewhere but in ways that affect us. So finally, let me uh, just have a few thoughts about whether it can happen again. Can it happen again? And I think, uh, well, there's no doubt it can. That is, we've had um, financial crises um, uh, every uh, five or 10 years um, over the last um, 40 years, and we'll certainly have more. Um, and we can look around now and we can see, um, as Lenore mentioned, and quite rightly, um, the concern that we should feel for undoing um, uh, the Volcker Amendment that uh, precludes um, banks using their own balance sheets to bet in financial markets. It's always troubled the banks, and um, under this administration they'll quite likely um, one way or another, retrieve that option. And if they do, they'll be retrieving it at a point where uh, the US Dow, the measure of uh, US equity prices, is now um, twice, was it, twice the level it was before the GFC, before the collapse of the Dow. It's now twice as high. The NASDAQ, which is the technology index, is three times as high. 
and certain stocks, the FANG stocks, Amazon and so forth, are out of sight height. Even so, um, the price earnings ratios, the um, price to book ratios in the US don't look outrageously stretched. Uh, it's not evident that something's going to happen immediately, but it's a source of some concern. US government debt's a source of some concern. The same is true of Japan and Europe. But you can't easily identify something that causes a crisis of the, of the kind we saw in September 2008. Nor, I think, can you in uh, China debt, which is unsustainably high, which is continuing to increase, but it's occurring in circumstance where it's all denominated in uh, domestic Chinese currency and it's mostly almost all held by Chinese domestic banks and in circumstances where the Chinese central government is quite capable, if necessary, of bailing the banks out. That is, it's an intolerable situation, but it's difficult to see how it becomes a crisis. And finally, at the moment, Turkey. Uh, Turkey reminds us, as the Asia crisis did, um, in 1997, that uh, countries which um, increase their liabilities and current currencies other than their own, that have a uh, foreign currency mismatch in their liabilities, are um, vulnerable, and they're particularly vulnerable if they borrowed in US dollars and the central bank in the US is raising interest rates, as it has and will. But uh, Turkey is now unusual in the size of its foreign currency liabilities. And again, I doubt we will see a global crisis emerging from there. But we will have it. Somewhere we'll have it. And, um, and uh, I certainly agree with Wayne. It's wise to learn the lessons of the last event uh, and prepare for the next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks very much, John. It's now time for questions for our media members, but I'll, I'll ask the first, and I'll ask one each, starting at John at the far end and working my way back. Uh, John, Wayne mentioned that uh, it's hard to imagine the world pulling together as well as it did 10 years ago today. I'm just thinking about why, um, Donald Trump in the White House and the sort of policies that are being unfurled over there, some of which are undoing, I believe, the, the uh, the um, regulations that were put in response to the GFC. Just how worried should we be about another GFC? And have the Americans not learned any of the lessons from the past GFC? Well, I think the Americans have learned lessons. I, I mean, um, there's no doubt in the world today, uh, banks have bigger buffers than they did. Um, there's been a lot of work in the Bank of International Settlements and in new agreements, new Basel agreements that uh, have made banks in all the advanced economies, and for that matter, in China, um, more resilient, tougher, uh, 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 and better, and with bigger buffers than they did uh, prior to the crisis. Um, but I think um, you raise a very, very interesting point. That is, were we in that kind of crisis, uh, where would the leadership, global leadership come from? Well, it certainly wouldn't come from the Trump administration, because um, the president, for good or ill, has shown a complete contempt for um, the G7, G20. He's not interested in um, what we had conceived of as Western leadership. It doesn't interest him. And he would, I think, also have great difficulty in including uh, China in the world councils that would be necessary to deal with a new global financial crisis. Um, but China can't be left out. So I do think that's a real problem. Um, and um, it's one we'll have to be very alert to if it occurs during his administration. Mm, thanks. Lenore, um, you, you raised a point about the the crisis in the media and the polarisation in politics. Now, uh, I suppose after this week we'll be seeing a much calmer, less polarised political scene, but perhaps not. <laughs> I just wonder if you can dig into that a little bit. And you know, could the media play a more could and should the media play a more constructive role? role or is this, um, you know, what's your view on that? Uh, well, yes, the media 
could play a more constructive role, but I think what we need to understand is that there, the, there's a sort of a business model crisis at the centre of the crisis of the media at the moment, and it means that the old model of, of, of making money via advertising doesn't work so well. The um, publications that want to continue to make money through advertising or through just through sheer reach of audience uh, are finding themselves, or uh, one strategy that you can use is to um, get a very loyal audience in this very splintered sort of online media market by uh, appealing to a polarised set of views and, and having that tribe as your own tribe and even sort of pitting them against other people with different views. That, that's, a, that's a market model that media companies in this country and certainly abroad use. And to an extent, it works, but I don't think it's sort of a responsible market model for the, the future of democracy. Um, if you use a market model like ours, which is reliant on reader revenue as the growing source of revenue, it means it aligns more the best journalism that you can do with what you're with what you're getting rewarded for financially. So I think there's a lot of complicated problems with journalism at the moment, and the and it's basically the financial problems of running a media company right now are acting in a way or can provide incentives that make it harder for media companies to behave responsibly. Thanks. Um, Wayne Swan, 27 years of economic growth and quite a number of those, uh, well, I guess half each, Labor and, uh, and, the, and the Coalition. So that would mean that you would have been, if you're born before 1991, you've never seen a recession and probably you wouldn't even notice it till in your teens. So you'll have 40-year-old MPs in Parliament who've never seen a recession, making policy based on this. I mean, is that a worry? What's the psychological, you know, this is getting the message to them, but what do you think the impact is of this lack of awareness of the crisis that we're talking about today? Well, I think it's important uh, we have an understanding that, uh, you know, growth is not preordained uh, and uh, nor is it driven necessarily by a particular set of uh, policies which are known as trickle-down economics. Uh, and if we would have followed the trickle-down prescription for a policy response, then we would not have been putting in place the sort of policy we did, and Australia would have experienced a very severe recession. So uh, having this series of events uh, around the 10-year mark is, is terribly important uh, to uh, inform people about how and why we got where we are, because you know that growth rate for Australia would not have been possible if we would have went into a pretty deep uh, decline for a couple of quarters and that's where the US stayed for about five or six years and the political, political dysfunction you're seeing flowing from that now is also producing political outcomes. But I, I would just pull you up a bit because whilst we've got uh, a, a reasonable level of growth at the moment, it's being distributed much more unfairly here at the moment, which is where so much of the political ferment is occurring. I mean, we've got the profit share at record high, and highs and the wage short share at record lows. Uh, and although our nominal uh, unemployment rate looks low, our labour force underutilisation is shocking and it is higher than it was uh, at the height of the GFC. So uh, our economy is nowhere near as healthy as the, un as the nominal unemployment rate would indicate. Uh, so there are many people out there in Australia who are living personal recessions because the way wealth and income is distributed in Australia is now far less fair than it was five or six years ago. There are many people that are facing declining living standards, and that is the backdrop to so much of the political and economic debate we're facing now. Uh, thanks, Dan. And our first question, if you could direct the question at one, one or more of the panellists, is Tim Shaw. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club and uh, Radio 2 Double Seat Breakfast. To you, Wayne Swan, firstly, can I quote your speech where you say, I also have grave concerns about Australia's capacity to respond to the next crisis. Is the next crisis a lack of policy relating to energy? We look at Labor states currently owned. Victoria would like to retain uh, government. They've got a policy of 40% renewable energy target by 2025. Your federal leader, of course, 45% uh, um, emissions reduction and also 50% renewable energy. Is the next crisis in the Australian economy a risk 
uh, relating to affordability of en energy. You just spoken about those that are having difficulty affording to live in our economy, and that includes low income earners. And Lenore, around this mess of, of, of energy policy, I think we're up to what, three policies in the last five days. Um, can uh, federal labor deliver based on their 50% renewable energy uh, target and their 45% uh, emissions reduction? Perhaps Wayne? one first. Oh, briefly, we are uh, paying a very high economic price for the abolition of the carbon price uh, and the subsequent actions that the government didn't take uh, to secure our energy market. Uh, and the consequence of that we're seeing in, in, in politics uh, and in economics. But it's part of a broader worry, I think, about policy at the moment that, uh, you know, that scientific and evidence-based policy making is now out the door. And what we're witnessing on one side of politics is what I call the Trumpification and radicalisation of the Conservative parties in Australia. Uh, and so much of the policy dysfunction that flows from that is the denial of the science of climate change. Uh, and, uh, and that then driving a whole set of policies which uh, are producing, in the long run, much lower living standards and all sorts of uh, 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 fallout for sectors of industry. I mean, the sectors that are really hit now and caught in the energy crisis are, are manufacturing industry in this country, which is, uh, you know, facing real headwinds, and that's got long-term employment implications. And, and I think that, and we will be putting a very firm alternative. Um, if we would have kept the carbon price in place in 2013, the outlook for Australia when it comes to energy would be entirely different. Uh, absolutely, we can meet those kinds of emission reduction targets. Um, it, an economy-wide mechanism to meet them would be vastly preferable and more efficient. Um, in the absence of an economy-wide mechanism, I guess state renewable energy targets will have to do the lifting until such time as we can have a sensible national policy. But the one thing we do know is the reason that power prices have gone up, or one of the reasons power prices have gone up over the past years is complete policy mess, schmozzle and um, confusion, which provides investment uncertainty. People don't invest in new generation in a consistent manner, and that means that the, the market's volatile and prices go up. And what we've got now is more of that. So I would suggest the outcome we've got now is likely to lead to increased prices because of ongoing uncertainty. And the thing that would bring prices down is just, just pick one sensible national policy and go with that. That would be great. John Edwards, do you, do you have a view on the uh, impact on the economic impact of the debacle on energy? I don't think I've really got much. I mean, it's a very specific to the energy industry and... Um, I don't think I've got much to contribute. No, no worries. Our next question is from John Millard. Thank you, Tony. John Millard, Freelance. Thank you all for your addresses. Mr Swan, there's been many transitions from senior positions with the Labor Party to Parliament and to ministries. Some of them have been successful, others less so. Uh, by contrast, too, many uh, senior ministers have gone to the presidency and the same rules apply. Many people would think that your transition has been a very successful one in as much as you still maintain a very public profile, for example, here today. Uh, if you agree with me, to what do you attribute the success? <laughs> <laughs> and other panellists, have any further Bad comments? luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, I, uh, I, I took a personal decision... Uh, that uh, it was time to leave Parliament, but I didn't particularly want to leave politics. Um, I wanted to have more time with the family to do things that, that I wanted to do, but I didn't want to give up what I think are the vital debates for the future of the country, and I've addressed some of those, uh, those, some of those questions here. So uh, I'm very much going to enjoy sort of uh, being involved in the political debate, but having a bit more time. But I do, I'd make this point. I, re I, I ran for the presidency because all around the world, Parties of the centre-left, such as the Labor Party, have effectively been wiped out in the blink of an eye. And I can see a situation around the world where the extremists on the political right are dominating democratic politics, which is leading to authoritarian outcomes in what were once very, very strong and proud democracies. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, a, a healthy centre-left in politics is exactly
exactly the sort of politics and economics that not only our country needs, but we need for global governance. I don't want to see our country or other countries dominated by either the extreme left or the loony right. Uh, so, given the history of Labor parties and other centre-left parties around the world, I thought I'd give a go at trying to strengthen it ours a bit more. Any other... <laughs> Anyone else want to buy into that one? No, I don't think so. <laughs> OK, and the next question's from Nick Stewart. It was your revelations about Kevin Rudd's deal with, to, to change the... Um, uh, some sort of find... trying to find a solution for the... Um, uh, the his deal about... Uh, the ETS. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That, that uh, completely stuffed uh, two days after... Your, um, your your book launch, the uh, his prime ministership. To what extent, though, do you think um, Shitstorm really dealt with the the whole economic issues, but it didn't deal with the the key question, which was the at the end of of the all this this money spent, basically people didn't feel better off. People were angry. People didn't feel as if all the uh, the Rudd's, Rudd's um, uh, attributes had actually made a difference. Uh, Wayne Swan, can I ask, you wrote also a book called Postcode. When you look, and you had uh, uh, graphs up behind you, when you look at the, the reality of the postcodes, they haven't changed. If anything, they've got worse after you were uh, treasurer for so long. Um, how can that be? And finally, John uh, Edwards, I'm not sure that our realities and your reality actually intersect in any serious way. Uh, you said, for example, if you believe measures of economic size. Well, quite frankly, I don't. I think that it's the individual that counts. And when you look at these, these measures, these global measures of economic size, I don't see any reality with, with people. And that's why I think we've had so many successive changes of government, including today's abortive attempt. We, it, the, it shows that people are just incredibly unhappy. When do academics get down from the high tower and actually deal with real people, real issues? Um, okay. I think I, think I was right. first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you go to the inherent problem of, of any government um, engaging in fiscal stimulus. If they succeed, then there's no counterfactual to, for people. So the person who didn't lose their job or the, you know, the business that didn't go under doesn't know, doesn't go to the polls the next time and go, oh, excellent, I didn't lose my job. They're kind of unaware. So it's, a, it's an occupational hazard for governments doing this kind of thing that they probably don't get the credit for the you know, for the disasters avoided because people don't know that they would have been having a disaster. I mean, that's just sort of baked into it. To what extent... I think there are many factors that are, are, are contributing to the ongoing wage stagnation since that time. Um, I think that's a, lot, that's a much more complicated uh, picture. I don't think it can be attributed to what happened then. I think there's many policy uh, inputs causing that. OK, well, I, I take very personally the, the notion that somehow poverty got a lot worse under Labor. It most certainly did not. Uh, and, and indeed, you would have seen a, an explosion of poverty and a huge erosion of incomes of people on low and middle incomes. If we hadn't taken the decisions we did, I'd draw your attention to the work from ACOS to prove this. Uh, the single biggest measure in Australia taken on poverty was our, was our increase in the age pension at the time we were there. So ACOS says you're dead wrong about that. And you're also wrong about saying uh, that there wasn't public support for the stimulus. In fact, the polling that has been done shows there is extremely strong support for our stimulus. It was just that the attempts by, by parts of the media to blacken its name over time uh, that uh, colour the public debate. Privately, people out there thought it worked and supported it. John, anything to add there? There was, um, I think this is quite interesting, it's quite an interesting point of view and question that you've raised because CEDA uh, commissioned um, quite a lot of uh, major polling at the beginning of this year 
And uh, what it showed is that uh, after, as Wayne says, 27 years of prosperity, no recession, relatively low unemployment, you can show that um, uh, the wealth of Australian households has gone up over those 27 years, has gone up eight, ninefold. It's quite astonishing. Uh, far uh, more so for Australia than any other comparable economy. And yet um, what the survey established, and I don't think it's new, you seem to be referring to similar surveys, was that um, people don't feel like much better off. Um, and uh, there's kind of, kind, of, kind of quite a high level of dissatisfaction. And this, uh, I mean, I assume this is, you know, the repetition of um, Turnbull's uh, news poll performances uh, month after month after month despite um, a reasonably well-performing economy have something to do with that. As it reminds me of Paul Keating's, you know, what are people going on about? That's right. <laughs> a similar situation. <laughs> um, all I can do is say what the, you know, what, what the economic numbers are. Yeah, OK. And uh, our last question is from Ben Oquist, who is the Chief Executive of Australia Institute. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is to anyone on the panel. It's about the banks. Uh, the bad behaviour of the banks comes start of the GFC, and we've seen the further revelations during the Royal Commission. Uh, uh, given that, um, there seems on the face of it a, a case for more regulation of the banks or, or something else. As we speak, um, I understand the government's moving to exclude the banks from the company tax cut, so even they're suggesting there's you know other... The special treatment for the banks is needed. Um, where would, uh, if do you think that's true, and where would you start in um, regulating uh, the banks if you support such a, an approach? John? Well, uh, I think it's, the point was made today, and I think it's true that it would be uh, very useful to now eliminate. Um, legislatively eliminate the grandfathering of uh, commissions. I think that would be quite helpful in reducing the incentives that are, associ that are associated with um, uh, uh, very poor conduct in respect of the clients of these, um, of the bank um, subsidiaries that um, are into funds management. Um, uh, the banks themselves are getting out of it because it's not it hasn't proved to be very pro profitable compared to their other activities. You know, the cost of, cost of capital or the returns in funds management for banks haven't proved to be what they expected. Uh, and maybe they ought to be encouraged to continue to get out of it. Maybe we need that separation. But I think more fundamentally, um, I, you know, I have to declare that I'm a trustee of CBUS, so you should take my remarks in that context. But um, the industry, we, we have discovered in industry funds an indigenous model is not replicated anywhere else in the world, which has been, um, as this Royal Commission I think has verified, just been superbly successful. Superbly successful and it operates basically without advisors. Uh, pretty much entirely without advisors. And produces superior returns, as you would expect. Um, so, I don't know, I think uh, somewhere or other we've got to um, uh, revisit the whole um, notion of um, uh, the same business owning both the uh, trustee board and the, effectively owning the trustee board the, and, the, um, um, uh, and the companies which uh, provide the services for it. When? Oh, well, Lenore, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say my uh, answer would have been the same as first as John's first point. I think that um, grandfathering uh, uh, in the future financial advice reforms was brought in by the former Labor government, but we know this government tried very, very hard to wind back those um, those regulations and safeguards. Uh, now, I think we do need to put, you know, change them again to their original form, and then it would be really great if there was bipartisan support to keep them that way even when we've all stopped paying attention and there's no Royal Commission on. 
Well, I think we now know why there was such fanatical opposition to all of the reforms that we were putting up in, in the financial sector when we were in government, but not even us thought that uh, things were as, as bad as they were underneath the bonnet. So I think we've now got to go back and, in light of the uh, outcomes of the Royal Commission and come back with uh, stronger regulatory uh, arrangements. And it, it may well be uh, of the nature that John uh, suggested before, um, there might be something about size, which is a, an issue that we've got to deal with. Uh, but the outstanding thing, I think, uh, for the country is how well the um, industry super funds have actually come through. It's basically a sort of a cooperative model. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> I might just, uh, just sneak in a quick sneaky one at the end. Uh, you're very experienced, Wayne, with crises, as we've seen from this. What advice would you give to the Prime Minister and maybe Mr <laughs> Dutton about handling the current crisis? Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thanks, thanks very much. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure I'll handle the staging of this, given all of this, but, but um, perhaps Wayne, we've got a book here, but uh, Wayne's already got one, so he gets a membership, uh, which opens our car park gate, which is most important, and uh, Lenore, uh, also a membership, and, uh, and the book, and one down, down to John. Please thank Lenore, uh, John, and Wayne. Thank you. Yeah.